you know the end of the Ark of the Covenant with the Nazis and the Ark and the ah don't look ah that just with no Nazis and you listen instead but it's still scary okay cool Pseudopod episode 869 June 9th 2023 yeah we know this week's story audio recording left by the CEO of the Ranvanian colony to her daughter on the survival imperative of maximizing market profits by Cass Cole and Matt Dovey. Hey everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I'm Alistair, your host, and this week's audio production is done by the actually superhuman Chelsea. Thank you so much for all you do. This week's story was originally published in Diabolical Plots, October 2021, and comes to us from Matt Dovey and Cassandra Cole, two of my favorite ever humans. Cassandra Core is an award-winning game writer and USA Today bestseller, and very recently, Stoker Award winner. Congratulations, buddy! Cassandra's work can be found in places like Fantasy and Science Fiction, Lightspeed, and Tor.com. Hammers on Bone, Cassandra's first original novella, was a British Fantasy Award and Locus Award finalist, and as I say, Breakable Things, her anthology, just won the Stoker. Matt Dovey is very tall, very British, very talented, and most likely very much drinking a cup of tea right now. He is the host at Podcastle, has stories coming out all over the place, and is, like Cass, a deeply excellent human. Finally, our narrator for this episode is the incomparable Autumn Ivy, who is responsible for countless narrations across numerous shows and apps, incredible voice acting work just across the board, and in This Wet Red, one of my top five pseudopod narrations of all time. So, tuck in, because we have a story for you, and we promise you, it's true. Audio recording left by the CEO of the Ranvanian colony to her daughter on the survival imperative of maximizing market profits by Cassandra Kaw and Matt Dovey, narrated by Autumn Ivy. You will just have awoken in your bed. Time is short. You're groggy, I'm sure, but it is important you pay attention. And do not leave. Do not move until this recording is finished. Listen. Marketing is everything. Corporations spend trillions to delineate histories that could exist, sculpting nuance and favorable scandals in the service of cultivated intrigue. All press is good press, an ancient quan. This is why we do what we do in the colony. The mythos of Ranvani IV, parlayed during prime time and burbled between mouthfuls of gin, is an essential part of what allows us to command a premium price for our products. Good marketing saved us all. After the withdrawal of funding by the Hatani Weld Roskin Exploration Company, following five successive years of underwhelming mining productivity, the colony had to turn to alternative economic streams to ensure its going viability. In truth, to ensure its survival so far on the fringes of galactic society. What we lacked in accessible mineral seams, we possessed in a cornucopic ecosystem rich in life forms unlike anything else the galaxy offers. And after years of subsisting on restricted supplies, we had developed an expert knowledge of how to prepare it. Less than a decade later, our cuisine is legendary. Consequently, representatives of Hatane Weld Roskin are now negotiating to repurchase ownership of the colony. But it is the leadership's belief that a better bargaining position can be obtained with further discoveries. And thus, we must expand our market capitalization through all available means. In that spirit... I detail here the history and specifics of some of our more famous dishes to be instructive to you. I have left you a snack on your bedside table. 
chew carefully. Pay attention to the flavor, that mouth feel. I taught you to be observant. Boiled the tendons of the snow cow, named for their bovine-like physiognomy, their four stomachs, and the ice that tensels their horn buds, develop an enveloping sweetness, meaty, with undertones of anise. Fried, they secrete neurotoxins. We learned this the hard way in our first year of colonization, when Halmar died on live stream. His death took exactly three minutes, forty-two seconds. I counted as I watched, forcing myself to acknowledge my responsibility for the incident. A biohazard crew was required to extract the body. Everything about Halmar had been rendered poisonous, unpalatable. Even the spit left crusted black on his chin. After the incident, snow cows were no longer exsanguinated. Instead, we dumped them wholesale into vats of scalding water. In a quarterly mining report, colony analysts detailed that the change had improved productivity by 7.2%, a record high. Hatani Weldroskin encouraged further experimentation with local food sources to reduce their long-haul resupply costs. In accordance with standing colony orders, Edelstein, upon accidentally discovering that a split-open rock contained red meat, scooped these innards out with his fingers. He described the texture as similar to a warm tar, claggy, but with an added uncutness reminiscent of the juice of rotted meat, and sampled the meat raw. He experimented with depositing the meat stones at various points along the shore and in streams and rivers, as it subsists on filtered particles and is thus flavored by its environment. It remains unclear if the later loss of his hair and nails was a side effect of a primarily meat stone diet or of the increased solar radiation he was exposed to before appropriate genetic protections were provided to colonists. The meat stones, one off-world chef later said, are most delicious when cooked into a mousse, folded with double cream and salted egg yolk, a touch of cayenne, some lemon juice. For best effect, serve with ginger garlic vinaigrette. Edelstein did not agree... The colony provided no official comment. When dealing with off-worlders, it is critical to remember that the end goal is always profit. Are you still chewing the sample? Good. Don't swallow yet. It's important you savor the layers of taste. Upon contact with temperatures above 42 degrees Celsius, the flesh of the swallow-tailed glass mantis becomes edible for precisely 72 seconds. Texturally, it has been described as creamy, fatty, tallow-like between the teeth. The taste is more complex, powerfully umami in the beginning before it lightens, inexplicably acquiring a delicate, pleasing milkiness. After 72 seconds, however, the experience sours, both literally and metaphorically. The meat emulsifies into charcoal and vinegar, a taste comparable to someone else's bile. For that reason, Cognoscenti will pay millions to light-skip one of our expert chefs from the edge to the core to serve their corporate banquets. It is a novelty. In our first marketing success, we gambled everything to make it known. Such gambles are the only path to success for those not born to it. And the fact that the glass mantis's cousin, more populous, more beautiful, fronded with magenta instead of a dull shade of peach, comes with all of the flavor, but none of the drawbacks, is never advertised. Besides, I would keep them all for you. We lost Hawkins, De Ruiz, and Patel to fits and convulsions. 
pink spittle foaming on their lips and drying immediately into grotesque structures like clouds at sunset. Before we realized the meat of the Ranvanian lamb was poisonous when cooked in individual cuts, having previously roasted them whole on a spit. I was sitting in the canteen with them when it happened. I've always made a habit of eating in the canteen with the other colonists, so the colony saw I shared the risks. I had a lamb steak upon my own plate. But for a few seconds, you would have been orphaned then, young as you were. You're better prepared now, I hope. The stomach of the lamb, lamb of course, shorthand for this creature that has a woolen appearance, though in truth its exterior is filigree bones, growing like spiraled feathers from the endoskeleton. It's an excessively alkaline environment. Cooked whole, the stomach bursts inside the lamb and these alkaline juices soak through the carcass breaking down the poisonous enzymes and giving the meat a sharp bite, like horseradish puree gone to mold. For the purposes of cooking more efficient portions than an entire lamb at once, an inappropriate serving portion for gatherings of less than twenty, a stomach may be kept in the parlor and the juices poured directly onto the steak from the esophageal opening. Due to the high alkaline content, the stomach is not at risk of rotting, and it ensures the juices maintain more flavor than if decanted into a glass container. No one outside of the colony knows this, of course. Publicly, we have maintained that the practice of preparing Renvanian lambs whole is sacrosanct, a religious imperative. The reason is simple. Galactic decree states that all cultural practices must be observed without failure. Because of this, we sell the ruminants by the herd. We do not make salt of our dead. That part is pure gossip. The Bwandu is a tree, not unlike the terrestrial bunyan, named for the sound it makes in the monsoon season. All parts of the plant are edible, including the roots, the nervous system, and the primitive cerebrum embedded in the heartwood. The shoots are a particular delicacy, roasted with cashew butter, seasoned with sea salt and black sugar. They can achieve a taste and texture not unlike the finest meringue. More adventurous diners, however, prefer to consume the brainstem whole, ungarnished save for some balsamic vinegar, a tang of apple honey. The resultant flavor has been compared to creme brulee, subtly spiced with garam masala and something ethereal. The process inevitably kills the bondu. Because of this, we possess legislation outlawing the practice. Because of this, our poachers make millions, assisting tourists with their fantasies of devouring a protected species. Practicality supersedes sentiment, my darling. I hope you understand this applies equally this morning, when you've woken alone. It's not because I do not love you. Never. That. Of course, in order to maintain appearances, we occasionally, and without warning, dispatch patrols to hunt and kill the poaching parties. Though never when the richest clients are in attendance. The raptor albatross is a large bird analogue with a wingspan exceeding ten meters. It feeds on large sea life, plucking it from beneath the surface with its sixteen serrated claws. The natural concentration of alkaline metals throughout the marine food chain means the raptor, albatross, is unsuitable for human consumption except at one stage. Fetal. The eggs are challenging to retrieve from the eroded cliff spires along the coast, a terrain that precludes the use of hover vehicles and requires colonists to climb by hand, exposed to the threat of the parent raptors and their claws. One day, when I return, I will show you the scars I have earned myself. Procurement is made more difficult by the size of the egg, in the region of 12 to 18 pounds, which also necessitates a long cooking process. 
slowly brought up to boiling over the course of 16 hours. This cooking process must be done from fresh. The egg cannot be frozen, as the piquant flavor and the smooth, tender texture of the fetus is only brought out by the slow reaction of its enzymes in the steadily rising heat. Freezing the egg kills the fetus and renders the cooked dish brackish and rubbery. More importantly, it divests the dish of its hormonal cocktail. A dead albatross cannot fear, cannot feel its nerves bake, its blood bubble to steam. As such, the fetal albatross would not taste of its final moments, and this is unacceptable. And of course, such a requirement presents an obvious economic challenge, which you will have already noted. If viable eggs are dispatched to customers, they may choose to incubate the egg and begin a breeding program of their own, undercutting our supply. For this reason, we only ever sell the eggs singly. No, of course, we also keep the black market well stocked for those who wish to purchase a second. It will afford them little successes, as it is the parents' diet of Ranvanian fauna that lends the egg its flavor. Divorced from the alkaline biome of the planet, the cuisine becomes quite pedestrian. Every civilization must have its trademark drink, a beverage representative of its culture, its fobles, its myriad of secrets. Ours is simple. A brandy recalling the flavor of Hungarian palinka, so saccharine that it must be cut with gulps of red brine. We use real apricots, real pears, mash, and meat both. Nothing allowed to waste. The taste, while uniformly sweet, can vary depending on the supplier. Some keep it pure. Some add cardamom, pure cocoa, kaffir lime, bold flavors to distract from the way the sugar congeals on your teeth. And some use apomorphines, engineered for tastelessness, to seduce the unweary. All, however, share a fundamental ingredient, the fermented seminal fluid of the vacant shark, matured for eight months in the harsh sun. You can see why we're so proud, and why I have never let you drink it. I love you too much for some things to be acceptable. Did you taste that? Consider the fat and how it's been flavored by repeated consumption of the bandeau, the creme brulee texture, its velvetiness. Compare and contrast the taste with the meat itself, succulent umami balm, underscored with anise and molasses. No livestock in the universe is so tender. The cuisine of Ranvani 4 derives its unique flavor palette and signature bite from the particular chemistry of the native biome. To a large degree, it is self-perpetuating and connected. The fauna tastes as it does because it eats the other fauna. And if bred off-planet and fed on plain nutrient paste, it loses its unique properties. There is one species that has, up until this moment, not been sampled and sold. Early specimens had too varied and foreign a diet to titillate the galaxy at large. It is only the second generation of colonists, your generation, that have been raised on a consistent Ranvanian diet, enough to flavor the meat. And no one has had a richer, more varied diet than you, my daughter. The fact you must concede... That was a strip from your upper thigh, prepared quickly. Imagine how a better cut might taste. First brined for a day, and then roasted with a marinade of brown sugar, cumin, chili, fermented blue krill. I've taken your legs before departing on my light ship. You must forgive me for taking yours and not another's, but successful leadership is built upon shared risks, and I must be willing to sacrifice you for this cause. The proletariat are children in their way. They subside on the stories we make for them. Narrative underpins every aspect of Ranvanian life in the end. I expect you to inherit the leadership one day. And so, 
This is another gift for you. Your own myth. The leader whose very flesh bore the blessing of prosperity. And oh, daughter of mine, I hope you forgive me for taking both your legs. The rich always want seconds, and are inevitably starved for more. More. Always more. Then we cannot risk this venture failing. We must give them what they want. You understand this? If we can drive a high investment now, the sunk cost fallacy will ensure our survival even if market economics cannot. We must lure as many bidders as possible to the auction of rights. We will make a success of your sacrifice. You will thank me for it later. You may not believe there will be a market for human flesh, but if I have learned anything in two decades of trading food to the rich and indulgent, it is this. There is a customer for every experience. Besides, what else is power if not an appetite for human flesh? Okay, first off, here is what the authors sent us. We didn't set out to write this as a story. We only really set out to try and gross each other out, exchanging segments in a series of escalations for our own amusement. But then, Matt considers it a crime to let any of Cass's prose go to waste, so it got bashed together into a plot shape, inescapably picking up certain mutual philosophies along the way. In the fullness of time, it was published in Diabolical Plots before finally debuting in the home it was always meant to find, Pseudopod, The Sound of Horror. Aww, thanks guys. Also, holy shit, there is so much here. The world building that's as precise as it is almost whimsical. These beautiful, nightmarish creatures that are all of a piece. All cogs in the same machine. All unexploded culinary nightmares or delicacies or both. I was hungry one paragraph. I was repulsed the next. This is submission food, or it seems that way. An endless theatrical parade of blood-soaked delicacies from a planet self-cannibalizing to survive. The type of story where you could stop at that and it will be brilliant and resonant and Cass and Matt did not get that memo. Or perhaps did and burnt it, smoking the meat of their next nightmare with the aromas of subversion of expectation and taking us to somewhere else entirely. Somewhere furious. Because rage is what this story is marinated in and it's the same rage we marinate in. I'm not going to tie this story to a particular news event, because I have no idea when you're listening to this, and honestly, there are three events today it speaks to. Instead, I will paraphrase no less an authority than John Carpenter's The Thing, and the line, no one trusts anyone anymore, and we are all very tired. The desire to bite back, or better, to punish someone for biting you, is one a lot of us have felt and continue to feel and the vengeance the colonists carry out here feel subtle and artful. At first, until the bile rises, and with it, the horror. There is horror baked into this story, that is my one food gag, promise, at the cellular level, and like all truly exceptional cooking, it finds complexity in the near elemental simplicity of its ingredients. Okay, two. The horror here is abandonment, until the horror is the casual death waiting in the flora and fauna, until the horror is the weaponization of that casual death, until the horror is the commodification of that casual death. A planet no one views as anything besides a culinary hotspot sliding knives into throats across countless worlds and industries. The Glass Mantis's cousin is the key to all this for me, the easy the safe, guarded by people who've been denied both and don't see the need to let anyone else have any. More horror. The final horror. The lingering taste of betrayal. Of yourself, of your past, of your ethics, of your future. Children bred 
as foodstock. Their legs literally taken out from under them to serve the very customers the colony has convinced itself it's punishing. Sacrificing the future to serve the very worst aspects of the present. A nuanced menu, prepared with meticulous care by four of the finest chefs. My compliments to you all. Whether it was witchery, some modern science, or a demon let loose from hell, I am unable to decide. Williams Bell from an authenticated history of the Bell Witch. Who, who's there? From 1817 to 1821, an entity calling itself Kate tormented the Bell family of West Tennessee. There is still no widely accepted explanation for this haunting. Coming summer 2024, on the new hit audio drama Afflicted, the Bell Witch returns to haunt a family in 1960s Tennessee. But only if we raise enough money to pay our cast and crew a living wage. Help bring this haunting to life and snag exclusive rewards like limited edition supporter t-shirts, producer credits, and more at afflictedaudio.com support. But do it quickly. Some perks are limited only to early supporters. We rely on you to pay our authors and staff and cover our costs. All of them. It is very tough right now. So if you can support us, please do. We've got PayPal and Patreon subscriptions that start at five bucks a month. Both get you access to our audio archive. The Patreon subscription tiers get you all sorts of goodies at the higher levels. Please, please help out if you can. It's very needed. If you can't help financially, perhaps you could consider talking about us. That helps a lot too. If you liked an episode, please link to it, or blog about it, or leave a review on your podcaster of choice. It all helps, and with your help, we can keep doing this. Pseudopod is part of the Escape Artists Foundation, a 501c3 non-profit, and this episode is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution and Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Join us next week for Nymph of Darkness by C.L. Moore and Forrester J. Ackerman, with audio production by Chelsea, hosting from The Wilson Fowley, and narration by Rish Outfield. We'll see you then, but before that, Pseudopod wants you to know that at times tonight, you will ingest fat, salt, sugar, protein, bacteria, fungi, various plants and animals, and entire ecosystems. We'll see you next time. Have fun, folks. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.